This is a story about a champion. No ordinary story. No ordinary champion. In the next hour, we will take you on an extraordinary journey. You will share the experience of a world-class athlete. Her relentless determination to reach her goal. Her quest to be the best. The story behind this world champion goes far and beyond that of just another sporting sensation. This is a woman who lives and breathes the psychology of winning. A story of strength and determination, mixed with indescribable highs and the bitterest of lows. Natalie Furman, In Search of Excellence. I was really sick back in the beginning of this year. I had uh, some sort of virus that uh, no one really put a name to. After three weeks of lying in bed, I made the decision to definitely, yes, go for this world title. I don't ever get sick. I can't remember in the last five years taking time off because I was sick. And I thought, God, what am I doing wasting time giving up way of skiing? when there's a major title to be won. And uh, I'm young enough to do it, and I can do it, so why not? It's now about five weeks until the world titles, and um, that's not long. In the, on the grand scale of things, that's not long at all. We had a bit of a bad incident at the last world titles in Queensland, where the South Africans got kicked out of the competition. It's still really hard to say how disappointing that was. There's no room for politics in sport. That has probably left a bit of a bad taste in some of the South Africans' mouths. It's, it was really unfortunate. I was affected in the women's. I'm the world individual invitational female champion. In my mind, I'm world champion because I beat everyone there was to beat there. So there's another reason that I want to be back there. I want to say, hey, this time it's on your turf and there shouldn't be any political worries and uh, let's do it properly. Yuck! Ryan. A lot of things motivate me. Previous success motivates me to want to go and do it again or better or harder or faster or more. As far as training goes, jogging with friends or getting out there with friends keeps me motivated. Inactivity motivates me, seeing inactivity. It's funny how people come up to you sometimes and say, you're going to surf while it's raining? I say, yeah, well, I'm going to get wet anyway. The path which has taken Natalie to number one in the world has involved a lot more than the effort of physical training. It is a combination of commitment, natural talent, and above all else, mental discipline that has shaped Natalie's character into that of a champion. When I started wave skiing, because I'd surfed, I always knew that I could be good. I didn't know how good. It all happened faster than I thought. And um, it's always been good fun. And then when I was Australian champion, I thought, there's no reason why I can't be world champion. There's no reason whatsoever. The main reason I became world champion is because somebody set me on the right path. And that somebody was my sports psychologist, for want of a better word, John Harvey. And I worked with him for about six months to a year, I can't remember. And ever since I started seeing him, things have gone my way. I got to, to know Natalie through the wave skiing. I, I recognised she had amazing talent. I, I, it wasn't hard to recognise that anyhow. She was a current Australian champion. Natalie is a person who struck me who wasn't using a lot of her mental talent at all and only struck me in the little that I'd known of her, but her physical talent was unquestioned. Shot, Rob. Oh, it's so close! I've known Nat about 10 years. 
She's seen as the best woman in the world, there's no doubt about that. She's the one they're all trying to beat. And uh, they've certainly got the job in front of them as far as I'm concerned. Although that will happen one day, there are youngsters coming up and of course, you know, one, they will just push that little bit harder and one day they may just beat her. But Nat is one of those people that tends to rise to the occasion at the right time. She just has that natural ability, basically timing, balance and just taking the sport that step further in the ability to be able to turn the ski in a way that makes it look good. Her graciousness on a ski I guess you could say. There's a lot of people, men and women, that almost get there but just haven't got that finesse to finish it off. And that's one of those uncanny people that can do that. I think she got quite a buzz from winning the national title. There was virtually no stopping her then. She thought, this is good, I like what uh, is happening. Sponsorship came with each um, title win, the excitement of overseas travel, and none of this was done without a lot of, a lot of things lost along the way for her. She had very little social life. She became very, very dedicated. Her training, was um, she was so disciplined as she was winning these titles. You have to program yourself to win. I mean, I used to train really hard, three hours a day. All I thought you had to do to win a world title was to put in the supreme effort on the wave ski and with your, your physical training, and you'd win it, but that's the wrong type of programming. I've since learnt that there's, there's so much involved. The exercising and, and training is the easy part. That's the stuff you set your alarm for, you get up in the morning, you, you do your training to prepare your body. That's the easy stuff. You've got to obviously watch your diet as well. You've got to get the right amount of sleep. That's very, very important. And the main thing is the mental rehearsal. That's where the effort goes. With only three weeks to go until the South African world titles, Natalie sharpens her skills by riding the waves of the many surf breaks off the coast of Western Australia. It is impossible to predict the surf conditions that will prevail in South Africa. So the only way for the world's number one female wave skier to maintain her edge over the other competitors is to be prepared for whatever conditions nature will produce. Aside from her busy sporting commitments, Natalie also concentrates on her career as a journalist working in both radio and television. And at 21 to 4, Natalie Firmus just called in with the surf report. How's it looking today, Nat? Well, we've got something we haven't seen for a while, Bill, a sea breeze wafting through from the southwest, or four to six knots of it, and at that strength, as you can imagine, there's no major damage, but at the same time, most of which is unridable. But I'm stoked with the way my career's going. It's exactly where I want it to be going. It's got to fit in with wave skiing at this stage, and it does. So what more can I ask for? Australia seems to forget their golden people, and people that are world champions, they put a lot of effort and time and many years of training and uh, job sacrifice into achieve that single objective. With Natalie, this stage she's won three world championships and now going to, for an unequal fourth world championship. Now, in anybody's language, internationally, she is a hero or heroine. She is at the top of her sport. And if you want to do something, she often says, just go for it. And that's the message that comes across from Natalie Furman. Not just a person that busts themselves to the boiler point, stresses out to achieve a goal and then collapses. Hers is an ongoing goal in life. Natalie was always a, a fairly gentle person. She had a lovely personality, but there was something missing. There was a killer instinct that she didn't have. 
So it wasn't until John Harvey came into her life, she really, really became focused, committed and dedicated. Overnight she went from, well, if I win this title, that's great. If I don't, okay, to this title is won. I've got it, it's mine. He was a cancer sufferer. And when an achiever gets told that they've got a, a potentially fatal illness, um, obviously it's, it, it's um, a real shock to the system. And he thought about his options, chemotherapy, all sorts of medical, clinical type cures, or using the mind to heal the problem. And he chose the latter option. He overcame his cancer. The doctors gave him a few years to live and he's outlived that estimate by you know, a decade or so. Uh, he used his mind to cure himself. The stuff I've learnt from him, I've applied to wave skiing, but seen, also seen the big picture that you can use the rules, the principles, the ideas across life. I never wanted to get 51% in an exam at school. I wanted to do as best I could. If it was 61, then so be it. But I just, I still wanted to do as best I could. With less than a week until Natalie leaves for South Africa, she has chosen to fly to the island of Bali, the home of her sports psychologist, John Harvey. Here, Natalie will use the remaining time to fine tune herself mentally and physically in an environment removed from the distractions of her busy life at home in Australia. Described as a tropical paradise, the island of Bali has remained one of the most favoured tourist destinations for Australians since it first became popular in the 1970s. It is here that Natalie has come to visit her friend and teacher, the man she says put her on the winning path. In the few remaining days before flying out to South Africa, Natalie will soak up his knowledge in this relaxed tropical environment. This is the last opportunity for her to sharpen her mind skills in the final training session before the big event. The ocean, I believe, as we know, is enormously powerful. I have a lot of respect for the ocean. I believe I can absorb a lot of power. No wave is the same. Once you've caught it, it will never come back again. It will never repeat itself. Every wave you've missed will never come back again. Every now and then, and quite often, you're reminded how powerful it is because you do get crunched and it is exhilarating. Natalie is still young and she still has a lot to learn. The good thing about it is she's willing to admit that. She doesn't think that she knows it all now. She's still asking for more information. She's still wanting to try new things. The biggest mistake with be it a business person or a sports person is thinking that they've done it, they've got there, and there is no other place to go to because they've become number one and they can't become any better or any higher. Those people that get there and do that and say that never seem to get back there again. I love it. I just get into this lifestyle, it's great. It's really good. I um, took a couple of ways to get used to it. It's gonna be the same in South Africa though. A couple of ways to get used to it. She's tuning up, this is the, this is the final stage for her. It's like the final tr training circuit before the big title. She's taking it very seriously. And she's looking good. She's world's number one. He just got, he's got the ideal life here. And I envy him. Rich man, I'm Rich man. You. Yeah. 20,000, yeah? <laughs> Bali was selected for numerous reasons. It was a place for me to get away, to spend time with me, to spend time on my own health, to spend time on my own beliefs, my own research in regards to the psychology of the mind, the functioning of the body. Bali, because it has uniform weather, the weather is fantastic all year round. It's close to Australia. It's a relaxing place to live. The food is natural and good and healthy. The environment is just fantastic. 
We are very influenced in our Western country from the forces outside us, television, radio, people, gossip, newspapers, magazines, public opinion, public surveys. I am immune from that here. For what I'm doing right now, and for what I'm doing with Natalie and with the other people I'm working with right now, this is a superb place because all the concentration really can be focused in the areas we want to work on because of the environmental setting we're in. Do what you want to do and don't feel ever it's impossible. Too many people say, I'd love to do that, but don't be a person who says, I'm gonna, I could have, I wanna. Go out and do it. Set up the goals that you want and go for them. And don't have the money as the objective. We're in charge of our own destiny. What do you want out of life? How many people really know? Be in search for excellence. And if you do that, I believe you'll always have the riches of life. And you really feel worthwhile. You really know I am the best. Life is there, we can do anything we want in life, as long as you set the goal, be realistic, and really go for it and aim for it. And enjoy life, life is just fantastic. I've always said to people, write out your goals for life. What do you want? And then work out how you're gonna do it. It's very sad to see or read in the paper, and we will see it every month, every week in the paper, where someone, for instance, is diagnosed of cancer and the doctor said he has six months to live. Invariably, he lives six months. He lives the goal out in his mind. I have been very fortunate. I've pulled out of the universe enough healing to heal myself. In 1985, I was given 14 months. Eight years later, I'm healthier now than I have ever been. When I look back at the lifestyle I was leading, which in business was go, 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 it was no wonder I got sick. But it's a shame we have to have such a shocking life to suddenly review our lives and set them up so we live a life that is just so enjoyable, you never want it to end. I'm not prepared to think about death seriously. I'm prepared to think about life seriously. Where we go after death, I don't know, and I haven't thought enough about it. I'm more interested, really, without sounding too smart, on where we're going whilst we're alive. I'm very grateful to be on this earth. I'm very grateful to be where I am and doing what I'm doing, because I'm doing exactly what I want to do and how I want to do it, and it's wonderful. And I thank the universe for that. I thank my creator for that. I certainly have to clarify that I have absolutely no qualifications in regards to the area of psychology. Um, motivationalists, um, mind training, it's certainly in the area of sports, although I'm now uh, doing a lot of uh, work in the area of business as well. And it is psychology, it's the psychology of the mind, it's more psycho-cybernetics uh, of the mind, of the body. But in short, it entails tuning the mind to perform as well as the body can perform. And in general, uh, the top athletes are incredibly fit and tune their bodies up, but they forget to tune their minds up. And my work is in the area of teaching them how they can tune their minds to be as good as their bodies. Roger Bannister in 1954 ran a sub four minute mile. For nine months prior to that, Roger Bannister not only trained on the track and ran as hard as he could, he conceived the idea and then he went and visualized it and he felt it emotionally. He spent a lot of time in his emotions feeling what would it be like to be the first person in the world ever to break a four minute mile. The glory of it, the fact that he's done the impossible. In 1954, he ran a sub four minute mile. It was incredible, he had done the impossible. But the amazing thing was not the feat that Roger Bannister did. The amazing thing was the very next year, 37 other athletes broke the four minute mile. And one year later, 300 more athletes broke the four minute mile. 
Why did it take Roger Bannister to do it once for those 337 athletes over a two-year period to do it? It took the belief. No one believed it could be done, but Roger Bannister. He believed he could do it, and he did it. It is my belief it's the greatest mistake of most athletes that they concentrate so much on the physical side. One has to, of course, be 100% physically capable and fit, but all the concentration is on the physical side. All the concentration is on the development of muscles, the aerobic capabilities, uh, how fast the times are, etc. And very little time, it appears to me, is being spent on the mental side and the mental preparation, the ability to get the mind and the body to both work together right down to the degree of understanding the food that you eat, understanding how the body uses the food, and even going as far as understanding how the body gets rid of the food. If we understand our body and understand our mind and function that way, the goal that one sets is always achievable. It's been the best move I could have made in these last few days. It's been really good. Give me the best view of Bali I've ever had. I've been to Bali five times before this. Bali's always been good, a good place to surf, nice place to come for, um, for shopping, for cheap stuff. But I've seen a side of Bali I didn't know existed and I've learnt so much. Lots of things about this country. I've learnt heaps about Balinese people. I've been to places that I just never would have gone because I've had an interpreter in John and I uh, didn't know what to expect when I came here. John said he had a lot more to tell me, a lot more to teach me and I didn't know what to expect. I just said, okay, fine, I'll be there. Words like relaxing and peacefulness come to mind. All that. I'm just ready. I'm ready to go. Smile now, that's it. Together. <laughs> well done. It's interesting. I always, in the weeks preceding a big competition, say to people and the media, because they always ask the question, what are you going to do afterwards? I always say, nope, that's it, wave skiing. Been there, done that, had enough. So I don't want to say too much at the moment, because I don't know. I'd like to make it my last. We'll see though, I won't make any hard and fast rule on that one. Natalie has a lot of things that she wants to do in her future. Whether she's ready to say goodbye to wave skiing or not and move into these areas, I don't know. I'm not sure. After each world title or major title, she says, I think this might be the end. I think this might be the last. But she hasn't seemed to be able to let it go yet. As far as what we read in the papers goes, trouble with between blacks and whites, I'm trying not to dwell on that. It's, it's nowhere near where I'm competing. It is in Johannesburg where I'm landing initially, but I'm going from one transit lounge to another and taking straight off again, so I don't think that's a big problem. Africa, home to the world's most spectacular wildlife. Continent of untamed wilderness. land of political change, birthplace of ancient cultures, and unknown to many, some of the best surf on the planet. This is Jeffreys Bay, South Africa, regarded by many as one of the most thrilling surf venues known to man. In the winter months, hungry board riders from around the world gather to pit their skills against the formidable ocean swells. Described as the ultimate surf experience, the chance to surf this legendary break is a priority which must be fulfilled for Natalie Furman. All I've heard is that it's the next best thing to Hawaii and Margaret River. And no matter what, I wanted to come down here for a day trip. It's great. It looks I mean, it's unreal. It's very big. It's a good size. And I think I'll start off down the way a bit because it's a point break which means you can hook in anywhere along the wavelength. BRFM, the 4 to 6 mix. And in front of that, um, Chris Isaac, Blue Hotel. Nice one. 
Right now, it's time for us to uh, start looking towards the big blue, Le Grand Bleu. It's ocean speak time. We've got in the studio a noted personality, Natalie Thurman. She's currently ranked number one in the world women's wave skiing. She's won the past three consecutive world titles and the World Cup. And she's three-time winner of both the Australian women's wave ski and the New Zealand Open title. First, let me uh, just tell you, I expected someone blonde. Natalie, why aren't you blonde? <laughs> I can't help it. <laughs> Welcome to South Africa. Now, how did you manage to get it all together in order to win three times in a row this type of world title? What's the secret? Well, firstly, I haven't won three world titles. I've won a couple of World Cups and the World Individual Invitational title, which is what the world title became last time in Queensland. And uh, you were expecting to make it uh, your day when, it ta when the time comes to actually give away that final prize on the last Sunday of the competition? Well, I'm not here to get sick, and that's for sure. I'm looking forward to my mum coming, and I'm quite anxious for the competition to start. I'm stoked to have my mum here. She's great, it's like the icing on the cake. I'm ready to go now. It's all falling into place. Preparation couldn't have been better. And she's the last piece in the jigsaw. I'm ready to go. Even though Natalie is definitely an adult and definitely a very independent person, she um, doesn't handle being overseas on her own very well. At home in Australia, she's got the support of uh, a lot of friends, family, familiarity, I guess. Overseas, she, she needs that support. With the tense political situation just prior to the first multiracial elections in South Africa's history, Natalie finds the streets of East London very different to the secure lifestyle she is used to at home in Australia. Three years ago when the state president announced that we'll be mo moving away from the apartheid system, uh, we certainly have come a long way and while the country is, shall we say, in, in a state of turmoil, as far as security goes at the moment, uh, I believe that this is a transitional phase that we're experiencing. And once we have a government of national unity, I believe that the potential for pr prosperity and growth is there. It's a tremendous honor to have Natalie in East London with us competing in this championship. And so obviously we would like to make her stay as comfortable as possible and as pleasant as possible so that hopefully you would want to come back on a holiday in the near future. One final surprise. Unknown to Natalie, John Harvey has flown in from Bali just prior to the competition beginning. After Bali, when Nat came to Bali, and after you all left, when, uh, when she spent three days, and we did some very good work, um, physical and, uh, and mental work, for her preparation for the world title, I suddenly realised I really needed to go. I needed to go and be there to experience that last week with her, to obviously help her as best as I could, and to really get the enjoyment and the satisfaction myself as well. So it was double-sided. I've gone to South Africa for her and also for me. Oh my God! <laughs> oh my God! <laughs> Hi. <laughs> Hi. <laughs> What are you doing here? Hello, world champion. <laughs> Everything is now in place for this champion to excel at her yeah, chosen sport. So the World Wave Ski Surfing titles begin tomorrow. Let something be private. <laughs> K-1 
many tops. World wave ski surfing titles down at Nahoon Reef, uh, East London, South Africa. About to enter the water now. We've got Natalie Furman, who's a journalist from Australia. She's been wave ski surfing for eight years. She's from Trigg in Western Australia and puts in 15 hours of training a week, putting really putting in a lot into wave ski surfing. And she's riding or surfing on a Shane wave ski. And she's also currently number one in Australia. There'll be three ladies in this heat. And remember, only two will go through to the next round. So a big one, you can sit back, all of those of you down at the beach, take, uh, take a seat right on the front, the front lineup. And uh, we're going to see plenty of action here from the ladies. Well, there they go. That's the start of the uh, ladies round number two down here, the Candy Tops World Wave Ski Surfing Titles at Nahoon Reef, uh, East London, South Africa. And in the back lineup now, we've got Natalie Furman. And looks like she's picked up the first wave in the heat and up and riding now. Natalie Furman, current Australian champion. She's picked up a big one. Looks like a good wave she's picked up. Natalie using uh, the white water now to try and score maximum points on that wave. And behind her, Lisa Ryan. Oh, Looks like quite a big set coming through now. Well, those conditions really look difficult out there at the back. Very difficult to score points in these conditions. Very, very difficult. Okay, looks like Natalie Tony's uh, selecting her seventh wave. And she's up and riding now, Natalie Furman of Australia. Really working that wave. So good heat there, very closely contested between Sandra Elst and Caroline Wood of South Africa and Natalie Furman of Australia. Australia. We'll wait, have to wait to see how the judges saw that, but well, uh, I well, don't envy them. No, it was going to be a difficult one, Alan. Taking the one slot, we've got Australia's own Natalie Furman going straight from through. Western Australia, yep. going straight through. She's, she's serious. She's looking for a world title here. We're going to see a good ladies event out here at Nahoon Reef in South Africa. And I think well that's, done. That's probably got something to do with the fact that she's been in the water the last couple of days. So yeah. she's taken advantage of the local conditions and she's done She's got well. used to the conditions. She's prepared, taking it very seriously and uh, we'll see her up there, I'm sure, in the final. Uh, Natalie Furman now up on an eighth wave in this heat. Oh, she's unfortunately tried to pull it off the it, top it and just off. lost it there. Yeah. There's still sets coming in from behind. There. And here it is in third place, Natalie Furman. In second place, Caroline Wood. And taking the top slot to a big upset in this heat, Sandra Elson, Port Elizabeth, South Africa. Well done, Sandra. You haven't been stopped. The easy road's been taken away. It's not bitumen now, there's a bit of gravel to go on. So to hell with it. Let's be happy with what we've got. What we've got to do is we've got to learn to smile and we've got to learn to say, well, I like to do it the hard way. We want to be the eternal optimist because we've got no choice, you see. So let's tell ourselves, well, we like it this way. This is what we want. Because we can sit here and say we don't want it this way. But guess what? It doesn't change. We've still got to go and surf a loser's round tomorrow. This is the third last day now of competition. And I've got to compete this morning, and you can't compete with the seas back, so you have to stretch. But this morning I felt so tired, I had to get loosened up before I even stretched. Now it's feeling not too bad. It's feeling 70% there. But it's a slow degeneration from here on in. Oh, this is a, well, this is a problem because it's got so much weight on the back of the ski. There's possibly three or four kilos of water in the back of this. And as you know, we're keeping Nat out of the room, but she's got a problem here. This ski's weighing, weighing twice as much as it should have because of this uh, ding she's got in it and the water's got in without her knowing. So this is the rush, you know. It's less than two hours before our heat and we've got to get this water out and the only way if we can get it out is suck it out. And I'm telling you, it's not an easy job, nor is it a nice one.
lovely weather. You wouldn't say it is in the middle of winter down here in East London. It's the pressure's going to be on these ladies now. But anyway, somebody's got to go through and somebody's got to fall out. A lot of the top top competitors have, through one or two unfortunate heats, found themselves in the losers section. We've seen the same thing happen in the um, the ladies now with Natalie falling into the losers. Yeah. And hopefully she can work her way right the way through. She'll be pulling out. She'll be putting everything into this one. I think at this stage they're probably getting a bit frantic, Alan, because they don't have the wave count they need at this stage in the middle of the heat. Well, they'll they'll be see really a set coming through now. It looks like a set, yeah. Looks like a bit of a... No. Still nothing. And just dropping out, Mandy Marie of East London. In third place, joining her, Natalie Furman of Australia. And going through to the next round. I am place, actually copying it pretty sweet this time. Yesterday, I was quite angry. Not with my performance as much as something I should have been telling myself to accept anyway, and that's the conditions on the day. The conditions were bad, and they were just as bad for everybody else. But not only were they bad, I had bad luck. And something else which was out of my control was my board. I found a, um, a sizable ding or, or hole in the board. It was the length almost of the fin box and it gained, I'd say, about 10 kilos just in that, that last heat. So all these things were against me and um, I don't think I was surfing my best, honestly. I, I didn't feel at one with the board. Maybe it's because it was heavier. Once more, the sound of crying on BRFM. And uh, you with me, Kyle Hannon, and the BRFM crew at the Nahoon Reef here in East London. Uh, Prefab Sprout's sound of crying gets me thinking about uh, the sound of crying that might be coming from a lot of uh, the top wave skiers in the world who found that Nahoon Reef has claimed a series of victims. One of those victims of the reef is Australian women's wave ski champion, Natalie Furman. Natalie, what happened out on the reef today? Why did so many big names bite the dust? Carl, it's been, it's been both uh, today and yesterday. And, um, you know, upon reflection, it's, um, it could be a number of things. I was here a week early to try and suss out the break, but um, it obviously wasn't long enough. I personally found it quite hard to, to, um, to work out exactly how it breaks and, and where it, it um, peaks up best and where it dies. And, especially today and yesterday where conditions are just so fluky. Plus, again, with me, I had a board that was gaining water at the rate of about 10 kilos every 20 minutes. So you were bailing as fast as you were paddling. <laughs> exactly. <laughs> but it wasn't all disappointment for Natalie and the other Australian competitors. The final result, first in the women's, Lisa Ryan of Newcastle, New South Wales. In the men's open division, also from New South Wales, Australian wave ski legend John Christensen. Australian athletes prove once again, without doubt, they are equal to the best in the world. Natalie has always wanted to be number one and she's been there and she holds numerous titles from other countries around the world, including open titles, which means she's even better than the men. She wanted a world title here in South Africa more than anything because it was a sanctioned event, it was a true world title. This is a target correction for Natalie. As a true champion, she looks at what she did and what she did wrong. 
studies what she could learn from that so the next time she competes in any event she knows she'll never make the same mistakes again. On the day she wasn't good enough in those conditions but she still recognises that she still has the target, the search for excellence, the search for being number one in the world, the best in the world and she's already setting goals for the future knowing she's learnt from the past. I think it's, it's worth saying this, and that is we don't have an education system in our country, in Australia, I think that's good enough in teaching the youngsters what winning is about. They think winning is coming first. Winning is not coming first. Winning is doing your best and striving for excellence. It's always possible to do a better manoeuvre. It's always possible to get one stroke less in a golf game or play better in a tennis game. Winning is not coming first. Winning is doing the absolutely best you can and searching for excellence in every move you make. Having the desire to be the best, and not dwelling on some of the mistakes, but taking mistakes or small failures as more target corrections as you continue that road to success. It's funny, I didn't win, but overall I'm not disappointed because I went out there and I did the best I could. What's important to me is to keep everything in perspective. Win, lose or draw the world title, life doesn't stop there. I still wave ski, I was always in it because I love wave ski. But there's still so much more to do. There's a goal every day, every month, every year. It's just something in me that if I'm going to embark on something, you don't do it in halves, you do it to be the best in it. <laughs>